Welcome to Thesen am Tresen, the Still Logistics Talk. And this is your host for today, journalist and founder of the Logistics Hall of Fame, Anita Wunser. Hello and welcome to Thesen am Tresen over the counter thesis, so to say. Welcome to Berlin, to all of you here and to all of you watching from your screens at home. Our guests today are Dr. Michael Tenhankel. He is the um, head of the Institute at uh, the Fraunhofer Institute in Dortmund, and Jakob Wikowski, CEO at the BLG Logistics Group, and Tobias Zierhut, Senior Vice President at Mobile Innovation at Kion. And our topic today is digitization. And of course, we want to discuss the question whether the warehouse is dead, long live the warehouse, and how artificial intelligence can change logistics. Digitization, of course, is a hot topic at the moment, especially in logistics, and some of us might feel sufficiently digitized once they manage to uh, set up a Zoom conference, but others actually think of full automated driving, um, swarm um, um, steered uh, warehouses, etc. And reality, I think, is a bit dire when it comes to logistics. We always wonder how these questions come up and when I did my preparations I came up with the following number according to the um, Center for Digital Competitiveness Germany only came up on the uh, second to last place only Albania uh, did worse than us so that's not really a great prospect is it so the question whether logistics processes will be driven by AI um, has actually been answered already and basically we're only asking for how we're going to do it and what business models of the futures are going of the future are going to look like we know that we can't have a future without digitization and we want to discuss today what that could look like. Let's start with the first thesis that Michael Ten Hompel brought, and uh, we're talking about innovations in logistics, and he's um, um, a hot name when it comes to this, the Pope of Logistics in Germany. Uh, and um, he is a professor at the Fraunhofer Institute, as I said. He's a research scientist, and he's one of the founding fathers of the Internet of Things as well. And he's been known for thinking a bit more innovat innovatively than everyone else. So whenever he says something, we should listen, because he's usually right. His thesis um, sounds a lot like a technology of the future. You say that the warehouse of the future is void of humans, and that robots are the future. These technologies will change the warehouses of the future, just like the multi-shuttle did 20 years ago, only now it will be much, much faster. So these warehouses are not the status quo yet. When do you think we will have warehouses without humans? Well, the um, scientist in me is always a bit more optimistic, but I do think that within the next few years, actually, the complete digitization and swarm technology is going to take over in warehouses. The advantages and how much of efficiency we're gaining here is this has always been our aim, our clear objective. Um, this is what we've been aiming for all along. And basically what we'll try to do is adapt to the new challenges and requirements, what with e-commerce and the um, challenges that the coronavirus pandemic has revealed. And from a technological point of view, a lot has become possible recently. The digitization of everything and basically artificial intelligence and penetrating so many um, areas of our life already, it's clear that this will also um, reach the warehouses. It's, it's a huge transformation that we're seeing. And you mentioned swarm technologies as well. This always goes hand in hand um, with this new disruptive uh, development. I'm always um, hesitant 
use the word disruptive, but here it really is very fitting because when it comes to artificial intelligence, we can use it to actually drive the individual forklift trucks and we can use swarm technology as well. So this is basically the first technology that is based on simulations um, that we can implement. And I think our systems um, will end up training in virtual reality and then with swarm technology, we can implement it in practice. This is a lot of complex development, clearly, and we mustn't underestimate this. This is not just the next generation of forklift trucks, which is, of course, also an important factor and an important development. But this is something else entirely. This is new forms of um, artificial intelligence in the warehouses on site. Well, this sounds very futile. Of um, oriented, but what makes you so positive, so optimistic, especially when we look at German industry and how it seems to be still stuck in the past? Why do you think it will be faster than the multi shuttles 20 years ago? I can remember that still that this took, you know, five to ten years until they really took over. Why would it be faster now? Well, talking about multi shuttles, I think that was a technology that that was new at that time. And the mood and the atmosphere, I think, these days is completely different. We're more used to new things. Everyone's aware of the fact that artificial intelligence is on the table. Now, it will be something that will be very advantageous. Sometimes it will even be the only way to solve certain issues and challenges. And I think what sets it apart from multi shuttles back then is that we already have all the single components that we need. And we have the awareness, as I said, the awareness of a transition transformation that can happen and if this transformation can happen and makes sense also from an economical point of view then I think we've learned that in times of digitization we will end up digitizing everything that can be digitized it's the next big thing and in interlogistics we have to be aware of this as well here we have businesses that work on a global level out of Europe, and they have leadership positions, they have pioneering positions when it comes to artificial, artificial intelligence in intralogistics. I think logistics will be the first industry um, where swarm technology will have its breakthrough. Yeah, I think that would have been my next question. Is it really going to be logistics? I always think that um, you know the automotive industry is, is usually the pioneer. Um, no, I think really logistics is leading the way in this area at the moment. Of course, we have to make sure that we get the right communities together and to get them to work together. This is a breakthrough um, when it comes to technology where we all have to uh, join forces where the developers and the researchers have to work together uh, even more closely with stakeholders in the industry. I think these are the front runners that we're seeing. It's high technology. In, in, F, in every aspect, and it's completely clear that there will be a breakthrough. It is within reach. Um, we have we have all the advantages. It's it's not even possible to be more flexible than we can be with this new technology. But for the businesses as well, who um, are a little bit stuck in the past when it comes to technology, I think it's a paradigm shift, wouldn't you say? Do you think economy is ready to make this paradigm shift, to really invest in technologies that are so far away from you know what we're used to these days? Of course, we're talking about automation in warehouses, but digitization, that's so disruptive. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's also a culture shift really these are very very fundamental changes that will that will get digitization off the ground in warehouses of course there will be changes on a business level as well because of this technology and therefore we have this cultural change in 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 businesses as well I have been noticing this as a as a scientist and developer at Fraunhofer as well um, we are seeing that the challenges are huge especially if we're talking about innovation based artificial intelligence even beyond swarm technology but the swarm technology um, part of course is 
is based on that. But what we're seeing is that the, the world is, is um, splitting not into East and West anymore, but in digitized and not digitized. And that makes us realize that we have to work together in large communities of different stakeholders and create the fundamental basic technologies that are required to bring this change about. This has always been the key word for years, you know, design thinking, interdisciplinary working groups, etc., etc. And we're seeing this happening. I see this as a scientist, but I've also been seeing it within business structures. We are noticing that we require new and different forms of cooperation between researchers, scientists and the industry itself because it is a huge task and um, we, we have to be really honest here this is this is not child's play thank you well before um i um let the other people discuss this thesis may i offer you some tea we've got a little bit of tea here for every one of you so that we don't go thirsty if we're talking about such hot topics as um such as digitization Let's talk about our next thesis, very exciting as well. Jakub Piotrowski has brought it with him. He is CIO and CDO at BLG Logistics Group. He's an IT scientist. He started out in uh, science in Bremen and then switched over to the practical side. And since 2012, you've been working at the BLG Logistics Group, responsible for digitization and sustainability, but also for innovation management. And I heard that you are um, a passionate cook as I've read on LinkedIn, and I think for an IT uh, scientist, there can only be one thesis. This is really a question of honor, I think. And your thesis is digitization will become really expensive and algorithms will decide over the success of uh, digitization. So you said it's going to be really expensive. That's interesting. Let's talk about money then. How expensive is it going to be? Is there a number that you can give us? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, this was um, quite the um, setup here. Um, Michael um, had a very impressive introductory speech here about, you know, algorithms, swarm intelligence, etc. But if we look at the um, budgets, um, the IT-driven budgets, for example, in my um, uh, business, and usually what we see is that 50% is for the operation of existing systems, and then we have about 25% for updates, for new versions, and then another 25% for new tools, new innovations. So this is kind of a, the rule of thumb that we go by usually. So looking at my own company, we currently invest around 2% of our annual turnover in uh, new ideas, uh, new projects where we collaborate with universities, for example, and other stakeholders and other stakeholders, etc. So we're trying to create um, proof of concept projects with these 2% because we have realized that there are so many digitization measures, so many tools, so many ideas. But it's the decisive factor here is if we have the right tool for the right use case. Um, so we have to make sure that we're really clear here because otherwise it gets really expensive really fast. Because then often people, you know, try to get the project to reach the next milestone to, to get just a little bit more money for yet another month. And then suddenly one proof of concept that was supposed to take three months um, is taking four years and a lot of money has gone down the drain and um, it's no longer economical. Try hard, fail fast. Um, so basically, it's try hard, fail fast, right? Is this what you're going after? Yes, definitely. And I think if we look at new topics, new ideas, we have to think really hard about what our use cases are supposed to be and then really set a budget uh, and stick to it. What is that budget supposed to look like? Well, like I said, in our business, it's usually um, if we look at all the projects we're currently doing within my company regarding um, digitization and innovation, I, like I said, it's about 2% of our annual turnover. So this is not just money that we can burn in our proof of concept uh, projects. We can't afford that in logistics either. But that's about the budget we're looking at. Um, this is what contains new projects and new ideas, maybe even disruptive approaches where we say, OK, we're going to switch to a completely new technology here and see what happens. Um, so for example, you know, we, we get rid of the fleet manager and replace it 
it with a new algorithm and see how that works or switch to swarm intelligence like you mentioned it so these are not just um software resources um but a lot of it is also human resources because of course we need humans who understand the processes who translate these processes in IT languages or to convey these messages to the people who train the algorithms. So at BLG, you have about 60 warehouses that you operate um, in Germany. Can you see these warehouses becoming um, uh, swarm controlled uh, warehouses with high end technology? Well, I mean, it did sound very interesting what I heard from my colleague before, but I think it definitely varies. It depends on the warehouse, it depends on the customer who runs the warehouse. You know, there are definitely some where we see, yes, you know, this might work really well, but then there are these, these bottlenecks where we say, well, how do we? We get the goods off the trucks and into the warehouse and yes there are also technologies who can make this happen without humans um, but yes um, at some point automation technologies reach their limits there too so um, yes shuttle traffic that might work with technology but at some point in the pro process we do still require humans we need you know the uh, delivery papers that need to be signed for example you know um, they often have you know we often get stacked upon stacks of papers that need to be signed and somebody needs to look through them needs to put the stamp on them etc so of course humans are still needed but then we have the warehouse process in itself so the the infrastructure within the warehouse i can definitely see technology taking over and then it depends you know how can i stock these goods uh, or what do these batches look like um, can they work with automation technology if i look at the automotive industry for example there are huge Huge containers that that weigh um, tons upon tons, and then I think we're, we're reaching limits uh, too when it comes uh, to to technology. But isn't this kind of a chicken and egg question as well? Because what if we change the size of the containers? Of course, this is interesting. And that's where swarm intelligence, I think, comes in and where innovation as a whole comes in. Because that's what we try to do. We look at um, individual processes and try to digitize them. But we always have to look beyond the individual processes because everything is intertwined. Exactly. But um, the technology that we're developing um, is also designed for that. It can look beyond individual processes and we have individual vehicles that can communicate with each other. But as you said, I agree with you, this is going to be one of the essential uh, factors of what are the batches going to look like, how are the goods going to be packed, etc. And of course, the customer expects us to to do these processes and to do the thinking for him to, to make the tailor-made um, packages, um, but then they want this to be cost efficient as well. And if we change production in order to change, for example, the size of the different packages or the size of the goods, then we have problems at other um, angles. So, yeah, and that's where it comes to standardization, wouldn't you say? Um, we can't be narrow-minded. We have to see the bigger picture. We have to see the whole process, right? And But I think that's where it gets uh, very expensive. But as you said, I think, yes, maybe simulating is where we need to start. Where, and then we can see where we can have an added value and where that becomes um, affordable and where that really um, is worth it. Yes, I agree. That's because, you know, digitization is not a means in itself, right? Um, digitization is doesn't can't serve itself. It has to be worth it. It has to be worth the investment, right? And that sort of raises the question if whether digitization maybe doesn't make things better, but only expensive. What do you think? Well, it may seem like it at first glance, yes. But the exciting thing about digitization solutions is that they are scalable, that they are very well scalable. Um, of course, it's expensive. It's an expensive initial investment. But then if we scale it, if we implement it, if we have you know new trucks, new forklift trucks that can can use this algorithm and then suddenly it becomes very affordable it's basically a copy paste project process if you, we put it simply and then it can all work within this new system so the scalability is what makes it affordable what makes it efficient
But as I said, the first step, the beginning, is where it's difficult, is where it's more expensive. But I've seen this in our own um, company as well. We have to have the feasibility calculations at the beginning, and that's often a challenge to argue this with your supervisors, because we can say, yes, it will only become efficient in you know, so many years. So how many autonomous technologies do you need in order to replace a manual technology? Well, this is where our proof of concept projects come in, because we are trying to autonomize different processes. We know, as I said, we cannot replace one autonomous um, process with one um, uh, digitized one. It never works. It has to all work within the bigger system. But I think the factor might be 1.2, where the scalability comes in, where it becomes efficient. Um, and it does definitely, when we when we look at the ratio of 1 to 3, one to three then it might be the wrong use case. Um, definitely. But if, we, if you make this investment um, at first, if you invest in a whole fleet of new forklift lift trucks at first, of course that's expensive than, that's more expensive than investing in swarm technology because that will become efficient after a while. But I would like to um, raise another point um, that comes time and again when we, when we have these debates uh, in Europe. If we look at the US, for example, there are 500 SMP businesses there. The, the 500 top businesses are all in the US, and they have 90% of immaterial um, um, values that are part of their turnover. And I think that's um, what we see happening in Europe as well. At last, we are evaluating what is valuable differently now in Europe as well. Um, Elon Musk really managed to become so successful so quickly because he also valued the immaterial things, such as digitization, for example. And I think that's something that we should see too. We should see the value of the digitization processes because it will help us scale up projects and then make them become efficient faster. But let's also not forget that the um, that US businesses are usually a lot more happy to take risks. Another thing that I think we often consider is that you know when we invest in trucks in vehicles um, that that will help us uh, standardize it will help us uh, try new business models but what we might also look into is you know maybe all we have to do is rent um, vehicles forklift trucks for example and then I only pay them according to the pallets that they transport so I think a lot is happening here people are trying out these new models renting instead of buying and that will make Make all these models a lot more um, easy to implement. And actually, you really have to um, produce services that are tangible, and that will help you grow. And you can also show to the customer that uh, there is a benefit in it for him too. And as you said, it does work that way. Simulations of AI, simulation-based AI, can do the trick. And um, you can actually use the calculations from there. What about German austerity mentality? Well, it plays a role. Well, but let me come back to your thesis, data. Tobias brought us a thesis that is very exciting, but first of all, your uh, special um, pro um, field is automation, product management, and uh, you uh, um, actually introduced uh, lithium ion technology in Kion, and you're now working with FTF, Michael's um, um, point here, swarm intelligence in FTF. Um, so, when somebody says um, collecting data is the wrong way of going about digitization, um, but seems strange because data are the new gold, so why is it wrong? Well, digitization always has to be uh, economical. And we often see that companies start collecting data, and they store data, and then they start thinking about what they can do with them, um, and they need 
to find somebody who can use the data and to have a path to market it. And we started early on to think about the data that we actually need and how we actually collect um, data in such a way that the process is flexible. And um, I would then collect different data for one thing and than for another. And uh, that brings in um, um, economical uh, ideas. Uh, do you have an example? Because Germans love collecting, after all. That's a well-known fact. And once you get data, uh, you collect them, you store them, and um, then you do something with them. But how do you actually get uh, the right selection of data? By thinking ahead, what are the data I want? And then these are the data I collect. And it's not just a matter of what data, but also how do I collect them. Um, one uh, customer wants uh, a data provider. The other customer wants to own the data. Then there are customers that are ready to give data to me. There's always data protection. So. Uh, um, with HEB Insight and an analysis tool, we can actually show the performance of a system, uh, the uh, uh, response times um, and availability rates, and we have come up with the first tools that enable us to uh, respond to system requirements and uh, to act in a very transparent way vis-a-vis -vis the customer. The customer can log onto the computer and can actually see a status um, um, in practically real time. Um, Coming back to uh, finances and Michael's idea of immaterial assets and values, well, 90% of um, uh, the assets of some companies are immaterial assets. And um, what uh, to be said was that um, it is important to connect the use of data with the data. And uh, finding out how data can be used can be used, in what form they can be used. So it is important to have a data room that can be used by everybody and where you still control what is happening with your data. This is very important in Europe. Data sharing can only uh, use what uh, is useful for the new business models. Especially in logistics, you cannot just uh, um, work with the others that um, use your data because your, their business model might run counter to yours. So this goes to show how complex things are. The uh, true value of things will only be clear when we have um, an overview over all, all the complexity um, at the same time. So what we need is the data room, digitization, and the uh, cultural shift. And uh, we need to be very clear here. This is uh, the link between us. Uh, we have the manufacturers um, of autonomous systems, we have those uh, um, who work with warehouse logistics, and we have uh, researchers, and that's precisely the mix you need. Uh, and this uh, has to take the shape of open source and open innovation, and then you can build business models on that. That's a very um, important aspect that needs to be uh, mentioned here, and that's data quality, because you can only use data that are good quality data. And uh, as you said, first of all, you need to ask yourself the question, what is the question I want answered by the data? What are the data I need? And then um, I can start uh, collecting the data. Just collecting just um, helps you become um, a messy in terms of data. So if data are the new gold, um, I can look at the, the price of gold 
per kilogram. Uh, but how do I actually measure the value of data? There is no price tag on them. Well, there are big differences between uh, um, the US and uh, Europe, uh, because uh, if you say 90% of uh, assets uh, are immaterial, um, the question is, uh, how do I actually appraise those data? And you can actually uh, steer yourself into a crash if you uh, uh, pin too much of a value on certain data. So I think Europe um, has a head start here. Of course, uh, we need to think of things uh, um, to uh, of ways and means to put uh, the value of data into our balance sheets. But what about uh, tech companies like Google? Um, data has an enormous value for them, uh, but it's also the use value of data. Um, I can offer a customer forecasts. Uh, by collecting data, I can actually um, forecast um, the demand for Monday, for example. So that's the added value. And uh, I can tell a customer that um, you might get a return on Monday if you sell a uh, an article on Friday, um, and that is correct to 90%, uh, because people go out and party, and then um, at midnight they order something and they return it on Monday. Um, so you should not offer that article on Friday. In the United States and in China, um, they say that the data are worth what the customer is willing to pay. And uh, actually, we do it the other way around. We think about how can we use the data um, before we um, put a price tag on them. So I think the right way of uh, doing it is uh, to think of uh, uh, connecting data and users, but let's get started with that. Um, and eventually, let's ask our customers what they are ready to pay. And if they pay, of course, uh, you can really say, well, this is a new market. Um, that's a direction I can actually move into. Uh, these are not traditional markets. These are really new markets emerging on the basis of data gold. In Europe, especially in Germany, we often find a mindset uh, that keeps you from uh, collecting data instead of thinking about how you can make good use of data. Um, often enough, uh, you have to ask the customer, you're not allowed to collect uh, the data, and um, very often uh, this mindset ruins it all. That's a big difference when you compare Germany with other nations. They think about uh, potential solutions rather rather than uh, um, turning it uh, down in the first place. Often enough, uh, concerns uh, come to the fore um, about uh, human resources um, in warehouses. But uh, let me return to algorithms uh, and open source. You said that the algorithm decides uh, um, the success of digitization. How do I find the right algorithm then? Well. Um, today, um, you actually do that in smaller circles. Uh, first, you look at rule-based, and then you look at AI and other control logics, um, which you can implement yourself or have implemented by others. But it's always um, coming back to my first thesis. Digitization is expensive if you do it alone, because there is so much du duplication. And that comes uh, back to the Open Logistics Foundation, where you can actually think about uh, um, um, 
topics that you can tackle on a broader uh, basis. And then uh, coming uh, back to AI and away from swarm technology, um, if uh, you look at certain things on invoices, where's the amount, where's the uh, uh, invoice number, um, and it might not be uh, um, in the same place everywhere, um, even though you get a PDF uh, invoice. Uh, this is something that you can actually work with, uh, AI-based uh, um, bills of delivery are a different use case. Uh, uh, and then, uh, basically, we might have something for invoice, we might have uh, uh, recognition tools for invoices, uh, other companies might have recognition tools for bills of delivery, and then um, you can put this all together and uh, get to, to a use case together. Uh, Michael, uh, is uh, the German's logistics business ready for open source? Uh, well, but it's actually being done. Uh, Schenker, Venus, Daxa, uh, there are a number of uh, logistics companies that get together. Um, they uh, um, actually uh, created a non-profit um, um, organization uh, that does exactly that, uh, Linux in logistics. It's uh, not a matter of um, uh, standing out uh, among your competitors um, or being against something or somebody or uh, working against a certain region. It's uh, a common basis uh, to be found um, that can be used to map out uh, all that complexity. These are basic technologies which we need to actually enter this new world and uh, then move on to uh, specific technologies such as um, uh, the swarm. And uh, actually, if I agree on a standard right away, I uh, actually cut off things. Um, and if it's not the right standard, uh, um, you actually lose uh, something. But that's the point about open source. You don't lose anything. You can actually branch out in all directions. In Germany, we tend to say, let's uh, come up with a standard, and we ask everybody. But at the end of the day, we either have have uh, um, something that cannot be used and handled, or it's uh, a standard solution that does not really uh, cover everything. Um, so there must be um, applicable interfaces, uh, and it must be something that you can download easily, so you don't have uh, thousands of uh, hours uh, of manpower um, being uh, wasted on developing the same software over and over again. And uh, sometimes you find uh, that other businesses uh, don't want the commodity of software. They actually uh, uh, want to do their own thing. And um, it's um, actually uh, economical not to have to take care of uh, an adjustment of uh, an interface over and over again. Let me ask a question to the practitioners. From your point of view, what is the most important success factor for digitization projects? What is really the uh, thing to do? Uh, if companies want to um, digitize. Well, they have to look at uh, what they want to reach, the objective, early on. They should not just start moving. Uh, they have to take decisions early on, and they should not uh, start a process that is simply a waste of money and human resources. Uh, because uh, if it doesn't work the first time, it might not work with a different technology um, either. Uh, what is uh, the area where you can be most successful uh, by digitization? 
digitalization? Is it the warehouse? Is it uh, transport? Is it the office? Um, every repetitive um, um, action. And you can find the use cases very quickly if you just uh, go to the shop floor and talk to people. Um, if you go to the office and talk to people and ask them what is most repetitive in uh, your job. Um, this would then be something that can be automated. Uh, and sometimes it's simple things that actually cost 25% of your working hours, and it could be automated. Um, and you'd have to look at uh, reasons why it can't be. I think that's where you can be uh, successful. Um, and uh, it's not uh, um, just uh, coming up with the use cases at your desk. It's a matter of talking to people. Uh, Michael, I think you are mostly right, um, and you're always, uh, as a researcher and scientist, uh, you're always uh, two years ahead of time. So what is the trend that people should bank on? Well, we talked about the swarm technology, and if I was supposed to add something to that, what I can say is that things have really changed uh, as regards uh, uh, the uh, perspective of future technologies, uh, and I'm talking about Fraunhofer. Um, and uh, that is humanoid robots. Um, a few years ago, I would have said robots are no I don't think so. But uh, um, Elon Musk actually showed us the way a few weeks ago. He said uh, that he would uh, uh, bring a humanoid robot to market next year, and that is an important impulse. Uh, before we get there, we will uh, also um, see a few developments uh, being marketed. But it's sim similar to the swarm technology idea two years ago. We said we can do it. Um, and uh, we know how to do it. It was a lot of work in terms of development, but it worked out. And uh, we are now in a similar situation. I think that the first uh, humanoid robots um, will actually be ready in about five years' time. Uh, those that can really be uh, um, used well, they might not really um, use fully uh, human, uh, even if that is my association. Um, but once um, um, a machine is able to uh, um, handle something, put it in onto a shelf, then you will, of course, come up with uh, uh, the uh, connection of uh, this being humanoid uh, and requiring a face and a name. So it is exciting. Let's see uh, what... Um, is going to happen. Just a very brief question because we're almost uh, out of time. When uh, will we see the first swarm warehouse? Uh, give me a year, 2023, 2024, um, <laughs> 2023, end of 2023. So digitization, as we noticed, is a matter of the right tools and of the right intentions and uh, of the right uh, culture uh, and many other skills. Uh, thank you very much for your thesis. Um, uh, thank you for having joined us um, this afternoon. We will have another round of Thesen am Tresen, um, and uh, this talk uh, will be on the website of still, um, www.stil.de. Thank you for having joined. Goodbye.